Hello and welcome back to another video. I want to ask you a question. Do you struggle with sin? Do you find yourself doing the things that you don't want to do and you don't know how to be free? Well, this video is for you. Today, we're going to be talking about some scripture verses and what the Bible has to say about overcoming sin in our lives. Hey guys, welcome back. If you don't already know, my name is Landon Langley, and in this video, as I already said, we are going to be talking about overcoming sin in our lives and what the Bible has to say about it. Now, for many years, me personally, I was trapped in sin, and I didn't know how to get free from it. Actually, for a long time, I didn't even want to be free from the things that I was doing. I was trapped in smoking and drinking, sneaking out very often, and I didn't really care. But eventually, I did start to care, and God was starting to work in my life and work in my heart, and He was working in me through conviction. I started to feel convicted or guilty about these different things that I was doing. And eventually that led up to a moment where I woke up in my bedroom and I asked him if he was real because I really didn't know. And in that moment when those words came out of my mouth, God, I don't know if you're real, but if you are, I want to know. I, I felt his peace come in my room. I, I felt his presence and I got chills all down my body and it was really real. It was a real moment where I knew that it wasn't just some story that I had heard about Jesus growing up in church or anything like that, that this God that I was told about was real and he was real to me in that moment. And so today I want to share what the Bible has to say about overcoming sin and how we can all live free from sin. Now after I, after I had that experience, it wasn't immediate, but it was pretty darn immediate I stopped smoking, I stopped drinking, I stopped sneaking out, I started working, I got a full-time job, and I could see and everyone around me could see that my whole life had taken a 360, and I believe that's the power of God in our lives to transform us, and that's what it's all about. If there's anything that you get out of this video, it's going to be the power of the gospel to transform our lives and to follow Jesus. So today I have a PowerPoint planned out for us so we can look at some scriptures up close and personal and we can see what the Word of God is saying to us. But I don't want you to skip out. I want you to watch to the end of the video. At the end of the video, I'm going to be talking about some common lies that the world is telling us that tries to keep us bound in bondage to sin. Some things that we've definitely all heard and maybe even believed, but they try and keep us bound in sin. So... Let's check out some scriptures. All right, guys, I have the PowerPoint pulled up here. So let's look at some scriptures up close and personal. As we can see, I've titled this PowerPoint, Overcoming Sin. Now, the scripture of the day is actually one of my favorite passages, or rather one of my favorite books of the Bible, which is the book of Galatians. And so we're going to be looking at Galatians 1.4, where it says, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. And so I want to ask the question to us, what does it mean when God was saying to us through his word, rescue us from this evil world? Does it mean that he's rapturing us from this world? That he is yanking us out of the world and teleporting us to heaven as soon as we get saved? I think we all know that's not what he's saying. But actually, Jesus gets really specific in John 17, and he lets us know that that's not what it means to get rescued from this evil world. He says in John 17, 15 through 17, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word which is truth. Now in this passage, if you don't know, Jesus is praying to his father before he goes to the cross. And he's asking the father not to take his disciples out of the world, but to actually keep them safe from the evil one. So if rescuing us from this evil world doesn't look like the rapture, it doesn't look like just yanking us out of the world, what does it mean? 
And I think to answer this question, we're going to need a little bit of perspective. We're going to need to look at this from the person that wrote the book of Galatians viewpoint. And this same Paul who wrote Galatians also wrote Romans. And he said in Romans 7.14, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. So we can see here from Paul's perspective that someone continuing in sin is a slave to sin, that they actually can't just be free of it by their own will. If we look a little bit deeper at this verse, Romans 7, 14, we can see that Paul is actually contrasting the law. And he's talking about how the law, it gives us good things to do. The, the law is spiritual and good, but I actually can't do it. I don't have the strength within me to do what is good all the time. There's this thing called sin that I'm a slave to. But what's interesting is, I think that in Romans 7, Paul is simply using present tense language to emphasize a past tense truth. I'll say that again. He's Paul is using present tense language to emphasize a past tense truth. Because if you look at just one chapter before Romans 6, Paul says something amazing. And not just once or even twice. Six times in one chapter, Paul declares that we are no longer slaves to sin. I'll read it here. Romans 6.6 6. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. That's amazing. We are no longer slaves to sin. So the question is, how do we find this freedom? What freedom was Paul talking about from slavery to sin? How do we, how do we receive or achieve this freedom so that we don't have to sin anymore? We can be free from it. Well, I think that we're going to find the answer to that in what Jesus said in John 8, 31 through 34. It says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciple if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we are, but we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And so here, a little bit of context to this passage, Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, they're saying, what do you mean, Jesus? We're not slaves to anyone. We're descendants of our father Abraham. We are not slaves. But Jesus is telling them, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And here's the nugget that I really want us to get a hold of here. He says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. And if you look even at the scripture before and after this, we can see that the context of this passage is about sin. The truth will set us free from sin. Well, if that's really true, if the truth is going to set us free from sin, what truth? What truth could Jesus be talking about that when we believe, we are set free from sin? And I'll tell you what, these two scriptures that I've mentioned here, Romans 6, 1 through 4 and Matthew 16, 24 through 25, these passages have, had, have held so much weight in my life for keeping me free from doing things that I really don't even have a taste for anymore. I don't even want to do them. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to be tempted to do wrong. Even the Bible says that Jesus, our Savior, God in the flesh was tempted at all points. So this isn't freedom from temptation, but it's freedom from the power of sin to cause us to do wrong. And it's actually the strength not only to resist, but to choose a different way and to be empowered in that way. So let's look at these scriptures. Romans 6, 1 through 4. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, 
we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. I'm just going to move on right here and read Matthew 16, 24 through 25. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Wow, these passages are really powerful. I feel like the common denominator that both these scriptures are saying, both these scriptures mention, is this concept of dying. It says in Romans 6, Or have you forgotten? Implying, by the way, that not everyone knows this, or some people forget, that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, when you were baptized in water, we joined him in his death. And then again in Matthew 16, that we give up our lives so that we can find it in him. We take up our cross and follow him. And so the, this concept of dying with Jesus and believing the truth. The truth is, is that in baptism, we were joined to him. And when we believe that and receive that truth, we receive him in his fullness. We receive Christ. We are joined, united, made one. I love the Bible. It's so multifaceted and amazing, but also really clear in a lot of different places that that when we were joined with Christ, when we were made one with him, when we were brought into unity, it's, it's like the same kind of unity that a man and a woman have when they get married. And it says in Ephesians 5, at the end of the chapter, that marriage is an illustration of Christ and the church. And so even sex and the way that a, a man and a woman become one in everything that they do, it's an illustration of, of what our relationship with the Lord can be like. And I believe that it's that same kind of unity that he's talking about here. We were united with him in his death. And so we've received the death blow, as people say. And now, not only have we died, but we've been raised. Now, there's one more scripture I want to touch on this topic. And it's actually a scripture that as I was making this video, as I was making this, this PowerPoint here, I really felt like the Lord impressed it upon my heart that I was supposed to add it. It's Luke 5, 36 through 38. And it says, Then Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. For then the new garment would be ruined, and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. And I believe the reason why the Lord wanted me to add this passage into this video was because... This passage, this verse, really illustrates further that we need to put off so that we can put on. In the context of this passage, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he's talking about the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. That in the Old Covenant, there was obedience to law, obedience to the law in order to attain righteousness. And then in the New Covenant, we receive righteousness as a gift through believing upon the cross and what Jesus did for us. And so there's a putting off in order to put on the new. And we can't actually hold on to the law in this context of this verse. Hold on to the law of works-based righteousness if we want to then hold on to Christ, which is a free gift of righteousness. It's one or the other. And I believe it's the same with overcoming sin. We can't just add Jesus into our life like we would add a new car or we would add a new attire or that's a weird way of saying that we would add new clothing to our wardrobe 
We can't add Jesus into our life. This is a one or the other. It's a surrendering over to God and receiving the free gift of righteousness, but also saying, you know what? I don't want sin in my life. I don't want pornography. I don't want these different things that have once held me in bondage. I actually want to lose my life so that I can find it in Christ. And when we do that before the Lord in prayer, we truly find the the spirit strength from him, the person of the Lord. And I just want to illustrate what that might look like, what a conversation with the Lord might look like if you were going to go and talk to him about overcoming sin in your life. For me, this is what it looks like. God, I don't want my life. I don't want to be held or bound by these different things. And you can be specific. Lord, I don't want to be held by pornography. I feel like this has been something in my life that has really come against me over and over. I find myself thinking things that I don't want to think, and then I end up doing things that I really don't want to do, and it eats away at me, and it makes me feel like I can't even come to you, and I don't even want to read my word because it confronts this sin in my life. Lord, I just want to be real. I want to be raw with you. I don't want this. Lord, I just ask you that you would empower me, that by your grace, we could overcome this together. God, I know you love me. I know you're with me. Lord, empower me. And I believe that that is what prayer can look like in the context of overcoming sin in our lives. So to illustrate this dying process a little bit more, we also want to look at the other side of the coin, which of course is living. So the truth is, is that we died, right? With Christ on that cross in baptism, we died. And freedom from sin is found in unity with Christ in his death. But if we've been united into his death, we just as much have been united with him in his resurrection. And so Jesus has made a way for us to have a brand new life. Like, How amazing is that? I heard a wise man say one time, there are no second chances in life, not really, except for Christ. In Jesus, there truly is a second chance at life. And not just that, but there's mercy that's new every morning that gives us the the room to do it right and to live it out the way that it was always intended to, live out life the way that it was always intended to. And and the Bible teaches that he's given us a new heart, a new mind, and he's put a new spirit in us. I, I don't know how brand new you could be except for by putting a new heart in yourself, by being, or should I say, having a new heart put in you and been given a new mind. It says in Corinthians that we've received the mind of Christ and that he's put his own spirit, the Holy Spirit, inside of us. Now, I told you at the beginning of the video that we were going to look at some of the lies that the world tells us that tries to hold us in bondage to sin. And so here it is. You've probably heard these two quotes, these two, these two sayings before, what you don't know can't hurt you. Or this one I heard many times, many, many times, ignorance is bliss. Like it'd be better not to know something because knowing it would hurt you or would be some kind of detriment to you. But I want you to see what the Bible has to say about these two common sayings. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We looked at the scripture just a few slides earlier where Jesus said that the truth will set us free. But the world is telling us that what we don't know can't hurt us. I believe that the Bible here is saying that what we don't know is actually killing us. It's actually destroying us and keeping us from real freedom and from knowing the Lord. So in conclusion, I want to encourage you guys that in Christ, there is a brand new life for us. And through believing on him, we, are, we receive a power that's not our own to walk out a life that he died to give us. Jesus calls us to follow him. 
and to do the things that he's doing. And I want us to know it's an invitation. It's not just a command. It's not just a you have to or else. This isn't a fire and brimstone. You're going to go to hell if you don't. This is a beautiful gift. It was always intended to be a gift. And it's because he loves us that he offers us this freedom from sin. So don't be hard on yourself. Don't give yourself a hard time. Don't be your worst critic. But actually give yourself the same grace and the same mercy that he's giving you. It's not a license. It's not a license to do what's wrong. It's the freedom to choose what's right. And so I want to encourage us that not only is this attainable and achievable, it's actually why we're alive and it's the freedom that he paid to give us. So if you like this content, go ahead and leave a thumbs up on the video and subscribe and click that bell notification so that you're notified every time that I come out with new videos. Every Wednesday is when these videos are going to be coming out. And leave a comment. Let me know whether you liked it. If you have any thoughts, any additional scriptures that this video reminded you of. And I'll see you guys in the next video.